Hi, I'm Tom Ravenscroft, editor of the Zine, and we're broadcasting live from the Zine Studio in London. Today, we've teamed up with Mad Architects to do a talk on social housing around the world with a panel of experts, including Yosuke Hayanu from Mad Architects. Hi, Yosuke. Hi. Uh, also joining us is Alice Brownfield from Peter Barber Architects. Hi, Alice. And finally, we've got Victor Body Lawson from Body Lawson Associates. Hi, Victor. Uh, in a minute, each of our panelists is going to show us a few social housing projects that they've worked on from around the world, uh, from the UK, the US and China. But first, I'd like to ask each of them to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about what you do. So, Alice, why don't you start? Thanks, Tom. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for having me here. I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing from everyone and, and what we're going to discuss. Um, as Tom said, my name is Alice Brownfield. I'm an architect and uh, director of Peter Barber Architects. We're a housing architect uh, and homeless architects working in uh, London, in centre of London. And outside of that, I'm also uh, a chair of not-for-profit action group campaigning for gender equity in the built environment called Part W. Uh, and I'm also a trustee for a charity in England called Action on Empty Homes. Um, so I bring many hats to this chat. Mm. I really look forward to it. Thank you, Tom. Great. And Victor, just give us a quick, quick, quick uh, overview of yourself. Hi, Tom. Again, my name is Victor Body Lawson, a Body Lawson Associates Architects in New York City. Thank you very much for um, making us a part of this global com conversation about um, social housing around the world. It's a, it's a topic that is very vital at this particular point. Um, we're located in New York City and our work is literally being around the tri-state area and um, tri-state New York City region and also um, internationally. We're also part of the AIA, um, American Institute of Architects. We've been on their boards and also on the board of the American Institute uh, Trust. Uh, and essentially, we are very excited to be here. Our focus has been on affordable or social housing and also educational housing. And we try to do that through education, um, teaching, uh, which is something that I've done, um, collaborative design, equitable solutions to housing and also integration of art and culture in all of our work. Glad to be here. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Victor. And finally, Yosuke, uh, quickly introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I'm Yosuke Hayano from Japan. I'm a principal partner of Mad Architects. We are based in Beijing, China, uh, but also we have an office in Los Angeles, U U U US, and also Rome in Italy. So mainly we are doing a lot of different um, culture uh, architecture, uh, but also this social housing become quite key uh, uh, feel for us to, to talk about, to think about the future of the city. So that's why today we are very appreciated uh, for the team, also Alice and Victor, to join this talk, to exchange idea, to exchange their opinions, like how we can keep uh, the diversity for the housing environment for the future of the city. Great, thanks. And just to kind of contextualize why we're here today, uh, as like you just mentioned, Mad's kind of predominantly known for its cultural architecture, museums, etc. Uh, but now you're moving into housing, affordable housing. Do you want to quickly explain why MAD is kind of not moving focus, but kind of expanding its focus into social housing? Yeah, uh, I have uh, two aspects to answer this uh, question. The first one, uh, this uh, buys one, social housing, which uh, tonight I'm going to share with the audience. Uh, this is like we started from 2014, which already we working on the eight years. Over this uh, eight years, we studied many uh, examples in different countries in history, also like ongoing project. Then we came to the conclusion that part of the challenging is not about how to design the architecture, but how we keep the diversity for the future of the city. How we keep the diverse like a living environment for the city. I think this is like common challenge for our generation, which is uh, that we know how capitalism is so powerful to push this diversity towards outside of the city. But like, we know like, how we can keep active, urban, living environment for the future. So that's why, uh, uh, but like we thought like uh, we are lacking the platform to discuss about this, to exchange opinion, to exp exchange the experience. 
profile we hope this architecture media such as this thing can help on this to become like a platform to exchange idea, exchange experience, to bring the future to be better place. This is the first aspect. The second aspect, because now uh, uh, we are based in Beijing, China, which is like a quick, like a urbanization has become quite important aspect. Many things happen in the city, the city is changing. Also, like we studied like many good examples in Europe, in Japan. And uh, then we saw many good uh, social housing projects happen in Japan, but somehow this social housing doesn't become like a, a long-term topic for architects. They do quite a good experience. They do good projects, but at a certain point, they move to the different topic. But seems like Europe, it's a little bit different. Like social housing become quite central, like a topic of the architecture field. The how this can, happening in Orient, like Asia, and how we can make this social housing a kind of crucial, critical architecture, part of the architecture culture. So that's why we want to put more attention on this topic. Also, not only about architects, as also architecture media, but I think important, the client, the which is government, also residents who are going to live in for a year, become part of this discussion to, to, to talk about what is the future. As that's why these two aspects was like a trigger us to uh, come to the team to organize this talk to to start a like, conversation. Great, and that, that that all makes a lot a lot of sense. And it seems like now it's just a, a sensible time for you to just go onto your presentation and show everyone what Mad has been doing. Can you see? Yep, that's good. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna do the quick introduction about our office. Uh, our office is not Arctic. We're based in Beijing, the capital of China. We have three partners, then my uncle and Dan Chun, uh, they're from China. I'm Yosuke Hayano from Japan. Uh, uh, as I mentioned before, we're doing a lot of different scale projects. This is Opera House in Harbin, north of China. Uh, but we try to make architecture as part of the uh, natural environment, also become space that become urban space for the people who come as a, their daily life. So this is uh, the lobby space when they uh, get into. And this is the uh, inside of the auditorium. The another project, uh, this is uh, the renovation of the tonno uh, in Japan, uh, which is it's including this uh, small building next to the entrance. So for this project as well, we try to blur the boundary between inside and outside to try to bring natural environment to us inside to respond uh, uh, as a space. So talking about the housing, so this is uh, the, our first project, uh, which is in Canada, uh, Toronto, which was uh, the private developers, uh, the project, the residential project, it highlights project. So this is a, a site condition. This is center of Toronto. This is a, a Toronto International Airport is behind. So this become kind of a new gateway uh, for the Toronto or for the future. But challenge for us was to think about what is a highlight residential project in the future, not in the dense urban condition, but in this kind of suburban condition. So how we can create kind of complex, like a complexity using a simple uh, methodology. So we try to create a kind of not dynamic urban movement by rotating a, a floor plate. So this is uh, the second project we just finished a few years ago in the Paris, not of Paris, it's called UNIQUE. So this project was quite unique because we have to team up with local architects who are gonna take care of this neighbor building, which we share the podium part uh, with our building. So our building is like a private developer's uh, uh, up, uh, residential project. But this one is more affordable housing. So the overall, uh, the purpose of the project is how to keep like a diversity of the uh, living environment in the, the district, in the city. So you can see the relationship with uh, uh, housing and the uh, cityscape. So the next project is not a uh, housing project, but uh, I want to put it in this context because this is the innovation of the house into the kindergarten. This is uh, in Japan. Uh, actually, it's my hometown. The client is my classmate from elementary school. 
the, he was running the smoke in the gardens. And then he came to us asking to demolish this house to build a new uh, kindergarten, the school. But we said uh, this uh, house is quite important for their school, also for their family. So somehow we try to keep this memory to the future. So we try to use the original structure, then nothing with the new fabric, to create this between space. And then people can feel somebody is there. It's like a housing feel atmosphere in the school. So this is keeping housing scale, but creating kind of new uh, urban response. Then coming to this vital one, uh, social housing in Beijing, we just finished. And the challenge was uh, how we can keep uh, 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 this social housing at extension of the urban public instead of like isolated, gated uh, island in the city. So this is uh, like usually this kind of social housing in China want to have very strong boundary at the, uh, the periphery, and then having few points to enter it. But we try to work with the client to go beyond this, then bring city coming into, breaking the site into six small uh, block by connecting with the bridge. They also, uh, the ground floor become an extension of the city. So by having uh, quite different urban uh, functions, such as hostel, elevator housing, shop, cafe. Then the roof of the, the podium become urban garden for the residents. So usually the boundary between private and the public was here, but we try to push to the this line. Then second level become urban green park. The upper level is more private housing. The another challenge was how we gonna bring the like, human scale for this kind of uh, scale of social housing. Like on the one side of the uh, street, how you can feel the other side is part of your space, part of your urban space. So this is a uh, current situation. The ground level, we keep many undefined gray space, which doesn't have clear uh, functional uh, definition which can be used for the future, a kind of flexible response for the future. The ground level, the community, the urban scale, urban space is start uh, happening. Then top of the, the podium, second level, become this the garden, lot of green space for the residents. Uh, also penetrating by uh, the bridge, also penetrating the building uh, by the hall. Uh, so this is the final page for my presentation, but I think uh, important challenge of like experience of what we learn is how not only about opening the boundary, but how to bring people into uh, this uh, urban space. We have to keep working with clients, also working with the resident, keep uh, curating a space, also like keep modifying space to respond to social change. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Josuke. That's super interesting. I think it might be worth just very quickly explaining, um, well, that project looks um, like super interesting and you've talked a lot about permeability and the bridges and the kind of the connection with the city. Can you just very quickly explain how radically that differs from kind of your standard Chinese social housing block? Yes, uh, basically we challenge, like uh, in different scale, we challenge uh, uh, this project. The one is about the unit. Because the unit, like all, most of the uh, social housing, like just south facing, to have like more typical standard. But we try to keep like a flexibility in how to different orientation to create like, a diverse of the center of the space. This was quite challenging for the space. The second thing, like a challenge, like not having gate at the boundary, which was like the most difficult challenge because controlling uh, is easy to have gate to open and close, especially. We have this pandemic during this process, which pushing this kind of a challenge a little bit backwards. But I, I hope that because like, we could manage uh, this to be happening, but still we have to keep this pushing and uh, working with the client by curating like how, how it's like bringing people inside can make better urban space uh, for the residents also for the city. I think this is by like designing completing building is not the, the finish, but just like a part of the process. Okay, so basically all uh, kind of 
a difference right on the small scale, the size of the apartment, the shape of the apartments and the def different directions they are orientated to on the kind of the tri three pointed star. And then also on the urban scale, making sure that it integrates fully into the set, uh, fully into the city. Okay, super interesting. Okay, and now next up, I think we have Alice. Um, is that, and Alice, can you just um, briefly introduce yourself and then uh, talk us through your presentation? Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Tom. And thanks for your scale. It's um, really interesting. And um, I, I think some of the things you talk about, actually, um, I, I can touch on in terms of how that relates to how things are kind of perceived in the UK. And um, uh, it'd be interesting to have a chat more with you. So as I mentioned earlier, um, I'm an architect and director of Peter Barber Architects. We are based in London. Um, we are uh, working a lot on social housing projects. Uh, Peter Barber founded the practice 30 years ago, and he's so it's a, a sort of very long sort of legacy of projects already starting to emerge. Um, and you'll see on the left here just some of our, our most recent projects. Um, we work with private developers, but we also work a lot with local authorities and housing associations. So what you're seeing here is the majority of these homes are affordable, uh, and some of them are social rent as well. Last year, we were really thrilled to win the RBA Neve Brown Award, which is a prize given to the best public housing scheme in the UK, and we're chuffed to be shortlisted again this year. Um, I'm also, as I mentioned earlier, a chair of a group founded by architect Zoe Berman called Part W. We're a collective of women working towards gender equity in the built environment. We're campaigning for that through design, but also in our, in our work practices as well. And I also come to this with um, a hat on, which is thinking about empty homes. And, and in the UK, I'll touch on that uh, as a bit of context as I go through. So I think I've only got five minutes, so I'll just whiz through this really quickly. But before I shared a little bit about our work, I wanted to set it in a context of the UK, um, just to sort of set it in a social political context before we talk about design. Um, the UK is the sixth largest economy in the world. Uh, yeah, in England alone, we have 274,000 people who are homeless. Um, half of those are children. Um, we know that there's a gendered aspect to this too. We know that although the majority of people recorded as street homeless are men, 67% of those who are statutorily homeless, i.e. they have no fixed abode, they're sort of sofa surfing or living in temporary accommodation are women. And we also know that, um, we, as I said, we've got 274,000 people who are homeless, but we also in, in England alone have over 650,000 empty homes. So as architects, we're sort of, you know, thinking about whether um, we need to be building lots of new housing, looking at our existing housing stock, trying to retrofit and bring that up to grade, but also thinking about why we have these empty homes in England and what we can do about that. We're also in London in particular seeing a lot of demolition of social housing estates um, being replaced by predominantly market sale housing. So we're losing a lot of social housing projects uh, and homes. But it doesn't have to be this way uh, in the UK. Um, in the aftermath of World War II, when the country was effectively bankrupt, uh, the government at the time was building 150,000 social rent homes a year at the same time we founded the National Health Service. So we know that this can be done. Um, by the mid 1970s, nearly half of our population lived in social housing. It's really, really common. And since 1977, the Thatcher's Housing Act, which introduced right to buy and successive governments of both sides of political persuasions have sort of failed to kind of get a grip on it. So we now have less than 8% of our population living in social housing. So as architects, we have a kind of real sort of uh, duty to think about how we can provide low cost but very high quality housing. And at Peter Barber Architects, we try to do that with a very high density but a low to medium rise approach. So I'll show you a couple of projects. I'll just whiz through them. Had to not go over time. This is a project in Camden in, in central North London. Um, it's looking at an existing 1970s estate. On the left, you'll see an existing site plan, and in the middle, you'll see the proposed. This has been built now. This provides just 15 new homes, but is a small example of what we think we can do to infill around existing buildings whilst also improving um, the kind of existing conditions, trying to avoid demolishing people's homes. So you'll see here some photos introducing a street through the estate, trying to think about permeability, as Yosuke was saying, bringing things down to street level, making things very legible, making sure public space is well overlooked, well lit, thinking about safety um, and making wider estate improvements too. 
We also look to historic precedents. Uh, and in the UK, we have a form of housing, which I'm sure um, we'll be familiar with in New York as well, called back-to-back -back housing. Back-to-back -back housing was introduced um, really in the Industrial Revolution when we needed to house workers very cheaply. And on the left, you'll see a, an old sort of section through this type of housing where you've got one row of houses directly backing onto the other, so no rear garden between. They were actually outlawed in this country in 1906 because they had issues with sanitation. Everyone shared a bathroom in a courtyard, so there was kind of some issues there, and also ventilation because uh, they were single aspect. But they were arranged around streets, so they were really legible, and they were also very cheap to build because you only got one external wall. So this on the right-hand side is a sketch by Pete uh, looking at um, a proposal for some houses for the London Borough of Newham uh, in East London. And this is um, 24 homes arranged around a central courtyard. And these are back to back. So what you're seeing here is a, is a four storey, two bed townhouse here, backing onto another one, arranged around the central courtyard. And you also get talked about gates as well. We have the same issue in the UK, um, or perhaps less so, but um, trying to make sure that the um, spaces here, the arches where you can walk through this courtyard and back out the other side, become public, become spaces that people can navigate through the city. So it becomes um, not just a private thing for these residents. And um, this is an image of it when it was just uh, finished in the winter. So it's looking a little bit sad, but it just gives you the sort of idea of what that, that scale is like. And, um, and I'll show you an image of it lived in now because it's looking fantastic. And on the right hand side, you can see the floor plan. So we've, we've sort of avoided those issues. Obviously, everyone has their own bathroom, but also we're taking um, a slice out of the building at the, at the very top floor, which is where the living space is located. So bottom right of the screen, you'll see that, which gives people a roof terrace and ensures that that living space is dual aspect. And that there's a big stack effect of ventilation through the building too. So this is a very high density for London. Um, and what we're trying to do is kind of carpet sites. So keep things low rise or medium rise, but bring buildings closer together. Um, and this is what it's starting to look like. So you can really see sort of people putting out prams and fairy lights and tables and chairs, and it's becoming you know, filled with pots and plants. And just lastly, um, just to jump up a scale a little bit, this is a project in, in the north of London, along the North Circular, which is the main arterial road that runs around London. Um, it's a thin, curving slither of a site here, surrounded by very large, detached houses um, in a quite a sort of suburban part of London. And this was a Transport for London site. They originally had it earmarked for widening this road, and they decided they didn't want to do that. They gave it to a part of their small sites program. And it had a capacity study by, by Transport for London for about 30 to 35 homes. This proposal provides 97. Uh, 83 of them have their own front door onto this new Mew Street. So we're creating a ride of, tour, of sort of four to five storey houses popping up at each corner um, along this north circuit to protect this new pedestrian muse from the noise, from the air pollution. And all of these homes access um, their front doors from this new space. So we overlook this road, we give it a positive frontage, but we bring everything to this side. And when you're in this news now, you can't hear this road. Uh, so this is a, a mock-up of what we hope it will be like in the future. And on the right-hand side, you can see um, quite a, an interesting house typology. This um, sort of if you call it sort of a, a unit here, it's actually three homes. Um, they all have their own entrance off this muse. So our priority is creating sort of socially active streets this gate leads into a ground floor flat and down again this gate leads up to a first floor flat and then this door or this door in this unit leads straight up to a top top maisonette so we're trying to make sure the street is very well overlooked very well activated and of course what this means is that the net to gross ratio is really efficient there's hardly any internal communal circulation in these buildings which means all of the money can be put into space which can be lived in, which can be rented or sold, example. So there's a kind of huge social benefit to this, we think, but also, um, you know, economically, we can be building much more useful space. And this is it currently, just a few sort of days ago, um, pre-planting going in, but you can see it starting to take shape along this sort of curving news and these houses on this side also doing a couple of things where we're looking at stacking uh, homes above the other, but still having front doors onto the new street. So I'll stop there before I run over time. But that was a bit of a whirlwind and I look forward to discussing everything in more detail in a bit. Yeah, perfect, thanks for that. I mean, it's, it seems like you've mentioned a couple of things quite a few times, densification for mm. one. Um, what, why do you think it's important for these social housings to be, these housing housing projects to be so dense? Or is that just something you believe for all housing should be 
Yeah, mm. we London. It, it's for all <laughs> London has a very low density um, to it. And we look to our closest neighbours with Paris and Barcelona, and we really are quite a suburban place. And then, um, you know, you go away to New York and you come back feeling like um, London is all suburbia. Um, and so we need to try to think about how to densify our urban spaces to avoid continuous urban sprawl into our countryside um, and there's a, a lovely project which Pete did which was a theoretical project called 100 mile city which starts to think about how we densify London from the outside in so sort of building a very dense ride of houses around the outside of it which is roughly 100 miles around the green belt and redensifying the city inwards because um, we we see too many projects in my, in our, in our, my view which build in fields um, which could be used for productive agriculture and um, and actually we, we need to start thinking about how we can use the brownfield lands that we have currently. And the, the other thing that struck me, you, you alluded to the decrease in the number of people living in social housing uh, dropping down from I think you said 50 percent to eight yeah. percent um, and you, you kind of frame that as a, a negative whereas mm -hmm. I assume some people would probably see that as a positive. Do you want to quickly explain why that's maybe not as positive as thing as people may think? Yeah. No, that's a really, really great point. I mean, the, the key thing is that um, in, in the UK, we have an affordable housing crisis. So we have a situation where um, housing in the centre of cities and towns is very expensive to buy and rent. And therefore, what we see is the sort of pushing out from towns and, and city centres um, of lower income workers and families um, who are moving further out. So we're losing kind of rich, diverse communities. And the benefit of having uh, more social housing is that we can ensure that, that our communities are, for, you know, that people who live and work in the city uh, sorry, work in the city can live there and that we have more diverse communities, which, um, you know, better us all. And um, uh, um, when my parents were growing up, they lived in social housing. It was very commonplace to do so. And now in the UK, it's reserved for really sort of the most vulnerable people. Um, and so we have huge issues of people living in very poor quality, private rented accommodation, which isn't regulated. Um, and just by comparison, we looked to somewhere like Vienna, for example, where 60% of the population live in social housing. And Vienna has been voted for the ninth year running as a city with the highest quality of life in the world. So, um, you know, I think, yes, it's a really... So, so maybe, maybe more social housing and also a, a change in attitudes towards social housing from, from the populace as well, for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and I think that the, the kind of the want to make sure the city is diverse. It also tied into what um, Yosuke was saying at the beginning about why Mad are getting involved in social housing in the first place. Great, I'm sure we'll come back to that. And Victor, uh, yeah. la last but not least, um, yes. just uh, quickly introduce yourself and run through um, your, your presentation. Of course, um, share my screen here. And can you see uh, the full screen? Yep, that's perfect. Fantastic. My name is Victor Body Loss, and again, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, I founded Body Loss and Associates in 1993 in New York City, specifically to provide design services to um, areas that did not have that um, social equity. And essentially, we um, placed our office in Harlem, which at that time was um, somewhat of a neighborhood that was disenfranchised. And um, since then, we, our focus has been on um, providing architecture and uh, particularly affordable housing. We've also worked on other projects, such as uh, university projects. We've just finished a, um, uh, a project with Renzo Piano and Davis Brody at Columbia University's new campus and, uh, and working on other projects um, at, at, at the same time. So my focus has been to figure out ways of empowering um, people it particularly in, in in this region in inner cities that have don't have the capacity of even talking about architecture or even getting a sense of what they need for architecture. So I'm going to just go through a few of our projects. This particular project is called Home Street. Um, it is a building in. Um, 
in essentially in New York City in the Bronx, which was recently um, on a site that had a church. The church had been essentially removed and um, we placed this building on the site. The, the building has only 63 units, believe it or not, for um, seniors. And there were 50,000 applicants for those 63 units. So it just sort of gives you an idea of what sort of demand there is for social housing. This is a 100% affordable project. The project also is a multi-generational, intergenerational project that has um, it, on the ground level, and you can actually see um, the entrance into the um, uh, multi-generational center, which is a, a place for training kids from the neighborhood about gaming. So the idea is to get a sense of how to um, do gaming. And at the same time, the seniors learn about computers. We essentially did a lot of um, interviews with the community. We talked to um, community leaders and also political leaders in the community to get a sense of what they needed. We also used a, try to bring the memory of the old church on the site. So we use Manhattan schist as the material um, for the project, um, even though it's, this is expressed in brick. This is another project, another senior project that is, um, again, a mixed use um, project. It is also in Harlem. It's the one of the first lead gold projects in um, in, in, in Harlem. Again, what we did was to use the materiality on the site um, to match our building so that our building would be contextual in its, in its relationship to the uh, existing buildings. The building on the ground floor has a um, space for residents, um, the seniors, and also on the lower level, there would be a healthcare facility that would be used by the residents and also by the community. So uh, the emphasis in our work is always to find ways of bringing the community into our building so that it becomes a fulcrum for development um, across the board. In, in, in other words, uh, this in this case, um, it's a building that has um, a health facility in it. We also try to maximize um, outdoor space. Um, in this particular case, the building is southern facing. And what we did was to put a, an, an outdoor space on the roof for the seniors so that they could always uh, be related um, to the environment. This project, on the other hand, is another social project that is um, in the Bronx, in the South Bronx, along a railroad um, or subway um, uh, tracks. And it's a very dynamic site. And what we did with this project, um, again, thousands of people applied for this, just to give you a sense of what the need. In fact, the United States government actually came up with uh, a study that shows that 4 million units of housing are needed right now um, in this in the United States and we don't even have the um, we're not even close to providing that with this project this is the Crotona Park Apartments like as I said it's right next to a subway station it's also another mixed-use building with a daycare on the ground level and residential units above. This has about 60 um, units. These are all infill projects. Each one of these projects that I've shown are infill projects or sites that have been recycled one way or the other. For example, the first one was a church. The second one used to have a piano um, storage a facility. And this used to be a decrepit gas station that was um, rebuilt and uh, demolished before we uh, essentially put the building on it. Um, again, this sort of shows our approach to the building was to sort of essentially show the dynamism 
on the site in the materiality and the composition of, of, of the building. Again, not only is it a, a, a mixed use building, the roof surfaces were also reserved for residents in the building. The final project that I'm going to show is one that we are all currently working on. This is, uh, again, another infill site that used to be a detention center for um, youth. It uh, was, it's called the Spofford, it was called the Spofford Detention Center, and it housed about um, 740 um um uh inmates when it was it was there in fact um the first phase of the building which is the one on the left um was opened recently and the mayor in new york city actually came to the opening and um uh, mentioned how he had been a um he had been detained in the uh in in this in the um in the center this project in one that we do a lot we also work in collaboration with other firms this is also um being done with um wxy studio uh a firm in new york city that we've got a deep relationships um uh, with in terms of doing the design just to give you an idea of what's going on the project is it's about five acres um, and essentially there will be five buildings on it. Um, the first phase is the building on the bottom of the page, which has the sawtooth um, roof with, um, uh, with uh, solar panels on it. Again, all of these projects are all going to be um, highly um, environmentally friendly. Um, the project is a mixed use project, again, where the base of the building will have community facilities like um, in banks, there's going to be a, a grocery store, there are health facilities. In this case, the project was actually named after a, a school a, um, uh, a, a primary school, which is the project is called the Peninsula, and the Peninsula School will be housed in one of the buildings. As I said, the base of the building is going to be um, mixed use. The, then it's around, it's, it's, going, it's designed around a central plaza that is um, uh, will have parking below it and also other facilities around it. Uh, in total, there will be about uh, 740 units of housing um, here. Um, Again, we designed it so that there would be views into the into the plaza and also a sense of community where the neighborhood could actually walk through the plaza, walk through the community, and at the same time feel as if they were part of, of the development. Um, this is the first phase. Um, um, building. This is um, what we call 1B. Um, this is about 200 units of housing. It has a, um, a theater in it that is all, all affordable. This theater will be subsidized by not only the city, but also the, um, the developers. And uh, again, below this plaza level, there are other um, amenities that will be related to the community. The building is in a, again, a recycled um, uh, manufacturing district. The next project, um, the next building, which is a part of it, um, is um, what we call 1A. And this building is, as you can see, the building to the left is the one that I just showed you. The one to the right was the one that I showed in the, um, uh, in the aerial perspective earlier. And these grand stairs lead up to the plaza. So the plaza becomes a plinth and everything above the plinth um, uh, is going to be dedicated to the residents. And um, essentially that's the, the kind of work that we do in, in New York City, particularly the work that we do in our 
practice in our studio is to figure out ways to empower residents by giving them amenities, by giving them, by placing them close to um, uh, uh, systems that will empower them so that when they live in these buildings, they can actually grow not only economically, financially, um, culturally, socially, and in every um every way that you can perceive. Um, again, the first, this building, this 1B that I showed earlier on, um, just recently opened. And again, there were about 100,000 applicants just to, um, to uh, that applied to live in the 200 odd units. So that's, that's it, Tom. Um, that's great. Yeah, thank you. So the, the thing is, uh, about that last project we've been looking at, it seems very clear that permeability across the site was super important. That's also something that the MAD project, uh, the project that Alice showed with the courtyard. Why do you think that kind of social housing particularly, it's so important that you have that kind of uh, connection to the city, that permeability? Social housing has typically been, at least um, when social housing developed in New York City, it, it was used as an, it was developed as really as an afterthought um, mm -hmm. to housing. It was a place where people were warehoused. And essentially, permeability or transparency wasn't something that was embedded in the design of a lot of these projects. Um, our approach is been to knit, knit the project to the fabric of the city. By doing so, we essentially find ways of giving to people who live in, in, in these buildings. And it also enables people who live in and work and play and study in these buildings to benefit from the facilities that are available to them. Um, throughout New York City, um, the, as you know, New York City is a hub. It's, it's a business center. And the I, idea of connecting people to their daycares, to their schools, to their churches, to banks, to jobs, to transportation is always something that we found has been a benefit to the growth of um, people who are particularly disenfranchised um, and people who've lived in social housing. And I'm not only talking about people who are disenfranchised, we're also talking about young people, you know? I, I, with the pandemic, it's practically become almost impossible to find uh, uh, affordable apartments in New York City because the rents have essentially skyrocketed. So mm -hmm. whatever we can do as architects to help um, young people, if you, you want to talk about young people, to get into um, what one could call the American dream or to be able to participate um, in this environment that is so expensive, it's almost a city that is, um, it, it, it's impossible to get a foothold in New York City. So our work is always to figure out ways to provide amenities and systems that could benefit people who live and play in our buildings. So do you, do you believe that social housing itself has a then an important role to play in the, the kind of the survival of cities. Absolutely. Kind of ensuring that cities remain kind of multi-dimensional. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, social housing is, um, as Alice said earlier, is, is about diversification, right? It's about giving people the ability to mix and to relate to one another. I mean, if you look at cities as a whole, you realize that cities are places where you almost think that they're designed for younger people or for young people. But realistically, they, they, they are multi-generational. So whatever we can do by creating accessibility, by creating places for seniors to live, by creating places for diverse races to live, you essentially blend in um, uh, housing to enable um, inclusionary um, living. 
And essentially, what we've been fortunate about in New York City is that there's been a little more thought about inclusionary housing. Essentially, when you have a project that is, we call it market rate, the idea of setting aside some of that for people who can afford who can't afford to live in that market rate project makes it a much more balanced uh, environment. So our, our approach is always to push the envelope as, um, as far as we can um, to create inclusionary housing and housing that is empowering to people live in it. And I, I assume that even though you guys, uh, the three of you are working all around the world in uh, vastly different cities, that that's probably reflected in all cities. So. Yusuke, would you would you kind of agree largely with what Victor's saying that 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 the importance of of permeability, the importance of social housing for for let's say Beijing? Yeah, I think it's quite important to see three different presentations, which is really showing different scale. Like it's reflecting different background of the city: Beijing, New York, London. That's totally different. But we're talking about kind of common topic, which is social housing, which we have to face the standardization. The how to make unit repeating, but still how to keep kind of contextual like a uh, response to the environment. How mm. this housing become part of the London? How this can reflect the culture of Beijing? How this can uh, respond to the situation in New York? So that's why I think that, yes, I agree. This is uh, social housing has lots of responsibility to cover uh, to talk about social issues, but which is different uh, context uh, uh, facing each other. But I think this. What like I want to ask the two of you because like how much this like a social housing of the site has to respond to the co local context because I believe like we now we starting like a new social housing in the south of China which is Shenzhen which has totally different climate condition with a totally different living culture which gonna be the answer uh, architecture answer should be different from what we have done in Beijing so I think it's same in New York same in Camden but very special local situation in London uh, as well. So how much like this kind of balance standardization or like how to uh, respond to like a social, like a, mm -hmm. a, urban context behind it. So also like, uh, is this important for the social housing or like uh, how do you respond or like how do you think about this as well? So Alice, maybe, maybe, maybe one for you. Obviously you guys, uh, the three of you facing uh, similar esque challenges but in vastly different cities so alice what's the kind of the importance of context as i think is what yosuke is asking yeah i mean it's it's so important I'm, I'm i have to just sort of clarify that when we're thinking about social housing in our office we just think of it as housing and um so we in, in london have um lots of traditional sort of victorian terrace streets but we also have um architectural sort of 70s which tried to turn us back to the car so we have lots of different types of housing and urban spaces that we're trying to respond to and um, in London 70% uh, of the, the city is housing so when we're thinking about a housing project much like you both have just said we're thinking about it as a piece of city and so often what we're trying to do is sort of re-stitch into those spaces streets because we think streets are a really useful way of organizing urban space uh, and a lot of our projects try to put as many front doors onto streets as possible. Even when we're going up to sort of much higher than I've shown you um, in terms of floor levels, we're trying to prioritise creating front doors onto the streets because then you can pepper pot 10 years more easily. So you can have social rented homes next to affordable homes, next to market sale homes and, and sort of dotted around. So you walk down a street and you have no idea which tenure is which tenure. And I think some of the, some of the best parts of London are, are like that, where you just have no idea what tenure the homes are and you create a, a kind of the opportunity at least for a community to support each other. People with different needs living side by side, you know, a, a large family living next to a, 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 perhaps a single older person being able to support each other in various different ways. So the context is really important. And um, yeah, I just want to sort of re-emphasize that we're thinking of social housing, we're still, thinking of it as housing it's just as a piece of city um, that makes sense and victor anything to add on you know context? You, you know um alice and you so i think um new york is somewhat different from beijing or london um in terms of its demographic makeup um and there's some these, these sort of nuances of race 
and um, social equity and economic equity that play a major role in the context of, of the city. And that's something that we take into consideration. Um, so to an extent, and then the scale is somewhat different, you know? And the, like I said, the homogeneity of people who live there are different. So those are things that were always constantly taken into consideration. For example, there are projects that we're working on right now that were in areas that were redlined, right? Typically, what I mean by that was that they were discriminated against so that, and those people still live there. So the, the emphasis in, in those sort of projects is to empower people who live in those communities so that they can now become part of the mainstream or they can now assimilate back into the culture. Um, so our work is, it really goes beyond just the architecture or just the bricks and mortar. It goes into the psychology of how people perceive their experience of, as people who live in this community. Um, that's, that's one. The other thing too, is that because of the scale and because of the way projects are financed, it, it, again, social housing is financed, um, the city, at least the New York City helps to pay for the social part of the project, right? And the remaining community facilities that go into the projects are paid for by the developer. Of course, the developer gets the site for literally nothing, a dollar or what have you, so that the project has to, to pay for itself long-term. One where it is um, the the city helps in terms of rent um, rent stabilization and and uh, um, subsidies to people who live in the buildings and people who develop the project. But the the base of the building, which is a community could be community facilities, are uh, ways for the developer to essentially um, make sure that the project. Can, and can, can continue to be maintained and continue to have um, adequate income. So that's why we look for opportunities to make these projects mixed use one way or the other. So essentially they are helping to integrate the community and also empower the residents. I've just... Um add to that if that's okay just because I think it's really I really agree with what Victor's saying and I think when we're thinking about social housing and housing we think about equitable design and so we're talking a lot about sort of the bricks and mortar as, as Victor was sort of pointing out but actually as Victor was saying it, the, the sort of thing that we need to pay attention to when we're designing housing city is the process who is involved in the process who is excluded from it what voices are we hearing from who um, is involved in terms of community engagement but also who's involved around the design table who's around the client table who's around the commissioning table the investment bankers you know we kind of need to look at very intersectional diversity but across the whole sort of food chain about who's creating our built environment and our social housing so that we it is informed by uh, not just Tom, you mentioned at the beginning, not just the star architect, not just a single hand, but a collaboration, um, because lived experience is so important to design. So true. And uh, Yusuke, within in Beijing, how does that work? Who is the commissioner? I, I kind of it's my naivety on my side, but I understand broadly how uh, projects are built in London and and New York. But in in Beijing, who's the landowner is it the state are they the clients do they uh, have the power this, to build uh, yes uh, this project the client is the city of beijing then mm. they call for the competition but also they're looking for the new kind of solution about current contemporary city living environment so that's what the mm. kind of their challenge for us to answer what the future of the city could, could be like a more mm. inclusive for the younger people because this house is for the lower income uh, urban residents which is just a new graduate or like a new people coming from the rural side, like how they can have their uh, space uh, in the, the city of Beijing. So that's why also like uh, uh, it's more government, also like they have uh, the management 
company over to Indonesia, they're going to keep running this project. So that's why we try to uh, push ourselves to be involved on the process of the, the decision making, uh, even after completion of that, uh, that, the architecture. But we are also working with them to, to curate kind of a uh, program for how they can keep using, how to make it uh, vitalization, vitalizing the space, uh, involving the lesson as well. So is there in, in, in China, in Beijing, is there, is there, is the government quite positive towards social housing? Because with, yeah, basically, what is it something that the government is, is proactive in trying to build more of? I'm going to move on to uh, Alice, Alice and Victor to get their, their views from the different prospective countries afterwards, but it'd be interesting to have the Chinese point of view. No, I think because, uh, for example, uh, we talk about density, but like uh, the, the density is quite different in this really different uh, presentation. Right? Because, for example, our project has 4,000 units in the one uh, overall project. We have to deal with 4,000 units, means how many residents, how many people are going to live. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why like, we're talking the same thing. Like, uh, because uh, doing social housing, somehow we have to take care of the number, figure, uh, the unit. But at the end, like, uh, there are going to be people living there. Each people have different background, different way of living. So how we can see through this, like, the people, like, uh, this how we can put using imagination to have like, uh, people like, uh, living in our space, like, which we design to activate. Because Alice mentioned about the street. Victor talked about the plaza. I talked about the urban fabric. I think that's, that's why we're talking about how important this urban space is quite key to bring people to connect with each other, also connect with the city, not like a just collection of the units, but number, but like a, how we can keep bringing like people in this like a real uh, space in the future of the city. And that was uh, quite uh, interesting to find from this talk. I suppose what I was trying to touch on, and maybe Alice and Victor can, with the three of you, obviously all very positive about social housing, the need for it and its importance as part of a city. But if it is so needed and so vital, why in New York were there 50,000 applicants and why are there 270,000 people without homes in the UK? Is it a lack of governmental desire? Maybe Alice, you can take that one. <laughs> Sounds like your streets. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as I said when I was talking earlier, um, it doesn't have to be this way. Um, we've seen in the UK it done differently. We've seen a strong welfare state. We've seen a government that believes access to good quality housing is a fundamental human right and it's not a commodity. We've seen it happen and we've seen it happen at a time when the country was really financially struggling. So um, my, my view is that it's an ideology and that it's, it's not an inevitable thing that we have uh, you know, 130,000 children in this country who don't have a home. Um, it's not inevitable that we have um, a housing crisis. Um, so as architects, you know, we um, can definitely use design um, to improve spaces. And um, for us, sort of design is a way of creating the opportunity for social action. But we also as citizens, you know, my belief is that we need to campaign and put pressure on and use our sort of agency to put pressure on the state to um, read, address the housing crisis. Um, uh, yeah, that's, that's my view. <laughs> I suppose um, it's a question you talked about the, the 60s and uh, the massive housing schemes and some of the kind of the country's best known architects involved then and mm. potentially some of the country's best known architects now not doing social housing. Do you think that as social housing becomes more topical, for want of a better, for want of a better word, that we'll see more um, star architects, like leading architects, getting involved in housing and social housing? Yeah, possibly. I mean, I think in the UK, we're seeing, um, in, in my experience anyway, we're seeing central government who are sort of moving away from the idea that, that the state has a role to play in providing good quality housing for people. And then we've got local authorities who are doing their absolute best to try and house people. And so the kind of discrepancy between the two 
So mm -hmm. actually central government and local government. And so you've got local authorities really struggling to build social housing. But I also think what's quite interesting in the UK is that we're starting to see collaborations between smaller practices coming together to join and design spaces together rather than just a sort of singular, much larger practices. And I think that's quite an interesting dynamic because it brings teams together who come from sort of you know, sort of different levels of experience, but also different generations and different it's sort of greater intersectional diversity in the teams who are designing housing and pieces of city. And I think that's that's probably quite a good way that we could move forward as a as a so, profession is to re really recognise the collaboration that's needed. I think that's a nice seg segue back to Mad, uh, to, to Mad because it, it, different people designing the city, different types of architects designing social housing is also uh, probably a good thing. And obviously, um, Yusuke, your, your, your studio is not necessarily known for social housing, but what do you think that studios like yourselves can bring to social housing that potentially people who have got longer track records uh, designing this type of building don't? <laughs> uh, I think that I go, the at the beginning, I mentioned because the purpose, like why we try to make this campaign, because to put more attention from society, also to get more attention from the government, also to get the attention from the residents who doesn't have any architectural background, but to this topic, the social housing is like a, their future of the city, their future of the living environment. So that we have to really not like just architect thinking about, but like just like discussing with client, but like we have to include the society into this topic, then we have to do keep challenging and uh, learn from the era, learn from the experience, then try to future to be better place. I mean, that is a very, very difficult because we all know it's kind of social housing is quite uh, sensitive, but a very mm. local uh, 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 topic. Like we have to very go into uh, to the community, go into the culture, go into the economic system to respond. But at certain sense, at certain level, we are dealing with a common uh, uh, difficulty. I mean, that's why, like from this 21st century in the contemporary city, we have to like find like a new solution for the uh, as I mentioned, like social houses as a housing. Yes, like people living there, it's part of the extension of the city. So how we can make more positive uh, the future for our city in the future? Uh, I think uh, by using this social housing, I think that's. Why I think it's important that we keep doing this kind of a talk, this kind of a, mm -hmm. a discussion, and bring in more people and try to find a better solution, better idea. I think that's. Uh, I think so, so you see your you see your role as partly mm -hmm. creating social housing, but also uh, mm -hmm. in China and abroad being an advocate for for social housing and its importance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, yeah, no, that's that's, uh, that's fine. And, and uh, Victor, um, what, what do you think? Um, well, uh, of a, you're obviously a, a specialist in housing and social housing. What do you think? Kind of uh, outsiders, other studios can can potentially bring because I mean it's well, diversity of design, I suppose. Well, first of all, I think housing is fundamental to the urban environment. You know, I mean, it's it's housing after all, right? Mm -hmm. And that's one. Two, um, affordability is also fundamental to e equity in in our society. That's secondly, and then thirdly, there's the environment, right? I mean, we are going into an, an, an a period where we've got climate change. And housing, with the, the amount of housing that's required and needed, has to address those sort of things. So how we address the way we build our houses to work with making it much more sustainable for the environment is absolutely an area that has a great potential for growth that's that's and then the 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 final uh, point is affordability it, without making it af making housing affordable you can't really have a balanced society so i think all of those things mesh together at least in the united states i think there is a political will from the federal government down to local government um in the united states that is trying to grapple with these things with social equity 
and the environment and, um, and affordability. And, and I think each one of these um, elements have uh, things that architects could actually use to create different kinds of housing. Okay, that's interesting. I, we've, we've kind of reached the end, but I've got a couple of questions from uh, that people have uh, asked from uh, online. So it, we, we're, I was kind of touching on there that architects are kind of beholden to the governments and potentially not powerless, but they are not as powerful as they like to be in um, in these projects. But what someone's asked from YouTube is how how can you make sure that the residents are involved fully and what ways do you work with the work residents to make sure they're not powerless within this, within social housing and when projects are developed? Victor, go for it. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, what we try to do as, as much as we possibly can is to get the residents involved. For example, we the way we get work here in New York City with for social housing is through um, one of the lead agencies here. It's called Housing for Preservation and Building, HPD or de department. And what HPD does before it sends out an RFP request for proposal is that they do community engagement. So they try to get a sense of what the community wants before the RFPs are written and then from that point we then sort of react to those RFPs. We also when we are elected to do the work we try to engage with the community as much as we possibly can. So I think that's one way. Of course you're never going to have everyone's agreement in terms of what they want but if we can get a rubric of the general consensus of what um the community needs from our research and from talking to community leaders we try to envelop all of that into the work that we do um yeah, uh, the, the objective is always to try to empower residents because to in our minds, it's a win-win. It's a win for the city, it's a win for the country, and it's a win for the communities that those buildings um, uh, existed. Alice, I imagine you're going to echo that pretty, uh, <laughs> yeah, pretty, I mean, yeah, pretty heavily. <laughs> it's so interesting to hear how things are done um, in different countries, and um, it's, it's not too different here. Um, we, we've had projects where we've actually been selected by residents. So the first project I showed, which was the project in Camden, which sort of infilled itself around existing four and five story buildings. We were, we were appointed by the, the local authority, but we were chosen by an interview with the residents themselves. And, and um, much like Victor's saying, the kind of collaboration and sort of understanding the existing condition challenges, the ways we could improve it, you know, we wouldn't be able to do unless we really engage with people. Um, I think in the UK, we've got a, a brilliant democratic planning system. Um, but I think it work could be done to kind of really make it clear how people can um, be involved and be empowered through that process and also to try and make sure that you know when we're doing consultation we're not just sort of doing it of an evening we're, we're doing it at various different times of day for example on a weekday a weekend to make sure we're kind of enabling people to be able to engage whether they work shifts whether they work daytime those sort of kind of very fundamental basic things and um, that we can do to kind of explain how the environment comes into being and how people can be involved in that process and, and make sure we're including people is um is work that architects should be doing as well as planners okay and yusuke in uh, in beijing how's that how's it work how do you ensure yeah. that the uh, for this, uh, by the way, unfortunate how the project is. So once uh, people start moving in, we start like making like a documentary by having kind of research, talking to the, the few residents, how they respond to this uh, new environment. Because it's going to be more keep uh, ongoing project. But we try to get the feedback, like of course positive feedback, like negative feedback, the how people are going to take care of this. Uh, security problem, how people gonna take care of this like a maintenance problem, how they're gonna keep this like a cleaning or so on and so on. But I think this kind of like, of course we got the positive feedback from a few residents, but I think this like a keeping documentary, bring into the public. I think that's gonna mean make this like a loop, like a getting designing, like a complementing, like a using, but like bring it to the next generation. I think this kind of starting like a book uh, close, mm -hmm. I think that's gonna be, uh, I think go beyond the architecture book, uh, 
uh, capability, but I think this is quite important as uh, a, a designer for the social housing. Because it's not only about the one generation, but they can more keep growing. Keep so, so not just growing. not just asking people before they move in, but also keeping a record once they're living in there, kind of updating, keeping keeping track of their kind of needs, desires, what things worked, what things didn't work. And I suppose that can impact the next social housing um, project. Yeah, I think that's uh, how we try to understand the social behavior of the community. Yeah. Okay, and <laughs> another question just from oh sorry. Alice, was someone going to well, say something? Sorry, I know we're really short <laughs> time, but I just wanted to add to that. So, yes, put, put, I agree with post-occupancy sort of understanding what people think of it after you've you've built it as well is so important. But just to add that in Wales, there's a really interesting role someone has in government called Commissioner for Future Generations. And so they're able to call in kind of major infrastructure projects to review what the impact may be for future generations, which is, you know, ever so much more important now than our current climate crisis. But also, you know, Yusuke was kind of alluding to it, you know, sort of learning from one project to feed the next, but also having these sort of slightly overarching roles that can kind of call in things with a view about what's happening in sort of 30, 40, 50, 100 years time is mm. quite sort of interesting precedent I think Wales have, have led. Then, Yoske, very quickly back to you. Then, now you've completed your first social housing project. What what would you have uh, done differently, <laughs> or what were you what have you learned from it that you you would change for the next one? Uh, because this is uh, the social housing in Beijing, so like this uh, in the location of the Baidu one, it's very special uh, as well. So now, as I mentioned before, now we are starting a new social housing in the south of China, it's Shenzhen, which has much more warm climate, more like a rainy, it has different use of the out, uh, outdoor uh, space as well. So now we finally doing this documentary because we try to make future of the social housing to be more key urban space for the future of the city. So how are we gonna get this like feedback to make our second next uh, project, the social house project, to be different, but also like uh, on the parallel of the development. You know? So like uh, uh, the showing like the Chinese culture, showing how people mm -hmm. use space, how they, so, and that, uh, that's why we try, we wanna keep this like a social housing as quite key, our uh, uh, the field of our office. So that's why and the one is like a doing designing, but also like a sharing experience, like this exchanging this uh, kind of idea with uh, the international. Uh, okay. I think that's uh, quite important for us. And you see, sorry, one final question just come in from uh, Peter on YouTube, asking um, with the, with your Beijing project, um, was it accessible to everyone? How did you? How did the kind of the government determine who who gets to live in it? It's obviously a oh, pretty nice project. Oh, yes. <laughs> pretty uh, standard because they have kind of a condition who can apply for, like how much uh, the age, income, so on. Then they have to apply, then become mm -hmm. kind of how much late. Then you got the lottery. Then you got the, uh, if you are selected, you can uh, move in. So this is okay. uh, quite common uh, for the old social housing in, in China. But uh, of course, depends on the location, depends on the project. They have different rating. Mm. So anyone could have applied, and it is then chosen on a lottery. Yeah, as long as they have, uh, they satisfy the condition. Yeah, the criteria. Great. Well, th thanks, guys. Um, uh, obviously, we've run a little over. Hopefully, it was worth it. Hopefully, everyone enjoyed um, the talk. Uh, thanks a lot to Alice, Victor, and of course Yusuke and Mad for kind of uh, co-hosting us today. And yeah, so thanks everyone, and hopefully, you've all learned a little bit more about social housing all around the world. Thanks, Tom. Goodbye. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> nice to meet Thanks. you.